faith belongs to Jesus, amen? I want to talk about a, a message series as we're getting into this, this new year. A lot of resolutions are always made. It's usually about two things. One is about money, how we're going to have my money, I'm going to get out of debt and all these things about money. And the other one's usually about my weight. Well, I was most convicted about my weight, so I'm preaching on money. No. <laughs> we do want to talk about this issue. It's important. I was looking over all my uh, files and sermons I preach and when I preach them, and I keep a, a running record of what I preach when I preach and the series and everything that we do on any given Sunday for the last 27, 28 years, I can go back and tell you what I preached on that Sunday if I look at the file. Because I can't remember what I preached last Sunday half the time. But anyway, so I don't feel so bad for you when you don't. But as I look through this, I realized that last year I preached on this topic and this subject twice. The year before that, I preached on it once. The year before that, I preached on it twice. The year before that, it was like three or four times. So I uh, don't feel that I've sufficiently in, in recent years covered this topic. And a lot of that's because uh, the majority of the people have been around here a, a, a while and uh, You've learned a lot of these principles, but we have a lot of new people that, are, that have become part of our fellowship and people have become new believers and in the Lord. There's some interesting principles that will literally transform your life, revolutionize your Christian life when you understand them. So we're titling this message, this series of messages on money matters. And you can kind of look at that either way you want to, money matters or money matters. So put the emphasis where you desire to. It covers all those things as we talk about not just giving because a lot of people when you talk about financial principles, they, their mind goes to one thing, giving, and immediately they, a lot of people just lock off their brain uh, because they really don't want to hear about that part of it. But this is something from Scripture that we really need to look at, and what does the Bible have to say, and give you some really strong biblical principles for living your life in such a way you'll find, you'll find happiness in your finances, which a lot of people don't have, and you'll find stability in your finances, which a lot of people don't have. Most people are living with debt. So we're going to deal with issues about uh, principles of work, uh, spend, spending, debt, and we're just going to cover a lot of particular ground on this subject, and we're going to deal with it very thoroughly over the next four to six weeks. It'll depend on how fast you listen. Amen. So if you're listening good and you listen fast, it's a shorter series, but we'll deal with it as, as, as we feel like the necessity is in, in our church. One of the greatest things that somebody shared with me as a very new believer, probably not even a year old in the Lord, was after I gave my life to Jesus and learned what it meant to walk and surrender to Christ as my Lord and Savior and what it meant to live a spirit-filled life. They sat down with me, uh, an evangelist did, and sat down with myself and my brother and went over some simple principles saying that we were going into ministry, we're in ministry. He said, if you're going to be in the ministry, then you, more than anybody else, you need to learn these principles if you're going to live a faith life. But he says, not just for anybody, not just for, it's, it, it, it's not just for you because you're in ministry, but this is a lesson, and these are principles which I'm going to share with you today for everybody. These are some of the best things you'll ever learn in regard to your practical walk in, in, in your, of faith in your life. This is where, as he began to tell me what he's going to share with me, he said, this is where you can see God physically, visibly move in your life more than any other way. So this is, this, what I'm going to teach you is measurable. You can look back and see what you've done and the results see what God's done in accordance to what you did. It, it's traceable, it's trackable, it's recordable. He said, this will transform your life. And then he sat down and shared with me about six principles from, on finances that uh, I'd, you know, I'd pretty much grown up in church and not really heard these specific things in the way that he presented them to me. And it was such an eye-opener. Now, I understand at that time in that, my life, I was about to be married. I was making $50 a week, living in a home with a couple of other young ministers, and we were just working the streets and telling people about Jesus and doing whatever we could to get the gospel out. And when I learned these principles and began to put them to practice, it was the most transforming thing. We built our life on these principles. We taught our kids these principles. We taught the church these principles. And these are things that we need to continue to remind ourselves and remind each other because they're building blocks in so many ways about a practical, I'll use the word of a just practical success in our life. And so as we begin this series, we're going to talk about that. You know, how, how do you define success in, in the days ahead? How, how do you define prosperity? And uh, how do you live in that kind of success that God wants you to live in? And not define it like some radical element in the church does today, as you know, that righteousness means you've got to be rich. But no, but what does it mean? And how do you experience that in your life of, of genuinely being just successful in your walk, in your, in your God, and walk within your, your own personal finances, and how you be honorable to the Lord. Now, I've heard it described before that being successful, 
A successful man is one who makes more money than his wife can spend. On the other hand, I heard that a successful woman is the one who can find such a man. So, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But that's not what success really is. Again, because I, can't, I cannot stress the importance of hearing what I've got to say today. If I could put on my spiritual goggles and look out there and see those of you whose minds has already clicked off versus those who's clicked on, it might surprise even me. Because this is a, as the video said, this is a touchy subject with a lot of people. Now, when I said last year I preached on giving twice, I would guarantee there's probably somebody in this room who thought this. Yeah, twice my foot. You mentioned it every Sunday. You're the person who didn't listen to the two Sundays. <laughs> Therefore, anytime there's any allusion to that, you get under conviction about it. Even when it's not being said, you know the pastor must have said something about it. Because it, you know, there's, there's a, it's like that, that touchy spot, you know, when you hurt yourself, you know, and somebody grabs you by the arm and it's hurting. Oh, don't touch that, you know. It's, a, it's that kind of thing. It's become, God wants to heal that in your life. And God wants to bring freedom in your life in that area. So as we talk about this, I'm going to get some very basics as we begin this series. But I want to encourage you not to miss any of this because uh, as we talk about these issues, like next Sunday, we'll talk about 11 steps that you can take that will radically transform your life and get you out of debt. And if you just practice them and you just do them, it's 11 simple steps. You could be out of debt in time. And, there's, and, and you know, these are, these are principles that, that we practice. We seek to practice with our church. We seek to practice in our home. Believers Fellowship, except for the Magnolia campus, is debt-free. And with all the assets that we own, I'm not going to praise the Lord, amen? Even with all the assets that we do own, the debt load is only about $160,000. And once we finalize our dealings with TextDot and what's going on there, we'll be debt-free and have a complete new building project that's completely debt-free as well. So, you know, these are things that we work for and we, we work to and, and strive for to come to this place of having this kind of freedom. L listen, just getting rid of credit card debt will free your life up. There's so many people that are so strung out with credit card debt, they, they just they live under a constant burden. God doesn't want us to live our lives that way. So let me just give you basically today some simple principles, and it starts with this one about who's going to be in control, you know? Who's really in control of your finances in your life? You say, well, I kind of am. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You have responsibilities, but God has some responsibilities. And when you can transfer to God those responsibilities by faith, saying, God, you said you would do this, therefore, I'm going to trust you. And that is a step of faith to say, I'm going to, I'm going to believe what you, you say in the Bible. I'm not going to try to grunt my way around it, find excuses, say, well, I just know if I believe that. I always tell people, well, then tell me what you do believe in. And most of the time I get no answer. You know, if you don't believe this, then what do you believe? The best place to find out what you believe on and, and establish a premise for what I believe is let's get to the, the Word of God. And what does the Bible have to say? There are some things that God wants to do in your life. There are some things that He expects you to do at the same time. God's responsibility, your responsibility. So let's, let's weigh this out a little bit today and, and see what the Word of God has to teach us. Because God does care about this subject in our life, and He gives us guidelines for handling our money. In fact, the Bible has more than 2,500 verses that just deal with this specific topic of possessions and managing our possessions, being a good steward. In fact, Jesus taught as much about money or more about this particular topic than most of the other subjects that he spoke on. In fact, he kind of climaxed it in Luke 16 and says, if you've not been trustworthy in handling the worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? Now, King James says that worldly wealth translated as mammon. All right? A lot of people, they don't understand what mammon is. You say, well, what is mammon? Mammon is worldly wealth. Mammon is money. It's the assets. It's the blessings that God places in your hand. If you don't know how to deal with that, you know, how can I give you the true riches? In fact, this is such a topic in our, in our world today. It's, it's, it is the main stress factor in most marriages today. The average duration of a marriage now in the United States has slipped down to about 9.4 years. The average length of a first marriage. 9.4 years. Every 27 seconds, another couple in this country divorces. About 7,000 divorces per day take place in America today. That affects some 10,000 plus children in America today. Now, it's doubled since 1965, the divorce rate has. 
In fact, the demographers predict that half of all first marriages will end in divorce and 60% of all second marriages will end in divorce. Now, while divorce rates have skyrocketed, the marriage rate is in a 50-year decline because most of your millennials and the fragment of Gen Xers, they won't get married until they're in their mid-30s, according to the latest statistics. In fact, this year, between 1.1 and 1.3 million United States couples will divorce. And sadly, researchers are telling us now that a great number of those, near half of those, are Christian, profess to be Christian to their marriage. George Gallup said that he's a very, very well-known pollster. He said that about 60%, 64% of all couples, their main argument in the family is over money. In fact, they tell us now the number one cause of divorce is not infidelity, but it's issues of finances. We used to say, till death do us part. Now it's kind of like, till debt do us part. That all the stress that we build in our lives, the debt that we acquire in our life, you know, we have, we have these problems. So the question gets down to this. Who's in control? Now we'll give you some spiritual reasons if we talk about this and why we talk about who's in control and God's responsibilities and our responsibility. Because the Lord says a, a great deal about money and possessions. And there's some very spiritual reasons he lays this out, but there's also some very practical reasons. The spiritual reasons are, it's how we handle you know, uh, our money has a big impact on our intimacy with Jesus. Now, I didn't say this. This is what the Bible teaches, all right? Jesus said, if you hadn't been faithful in the use of worldly things, worldly wealth, worldly mammon, who's going to entrust the true riches to you, as it says in Luke 16? If you haven't been faithful with what I've given you in a physical, worldly wealth sense, and you're not faithful with what I've placed in your hands and blessed you with, how can I trust you with, he uses the terminology from the lips of Jesus, he says, true riches. How can I bless you with the true riches? In other words, how do you think you're going to ever be able to experiment, experience and understand a deeper relationship with me, things that really are of value, things that are really important, if you can't deal with those things that aren't near as important as the spiritual things? So he said, well, he's telling us here that how I deal with these possessions of mine does impact my intimacy with Christ and the deepening of my relationship. Why? Because money is a competitor with Christ for lordship over our life. Money, material things, you know, these are the things that seek to control my life and get a hold of my heart and my life. And ultimately, I'm ruled instead of by grace and by the Holy Spirit of God. I get ruled by selfishness and covetousness and greed and the lust of things that I want more and more and more. Jesus in the Word of God reveals a lot about our possessions. From Genesis to the book of Revelation, Jesus, the living Word, has a great deal to say about all those things. He, ex he explains in the Word of God issues about earning. He explains the importance of work. He talks about spending. He talks about saving. He talks about investing. He talks about giving. He talks about getting. He talks about telling other people and teaching our children and our grandchildren those principles that I just mentioned about all those elements from work to earnings to saving and how important it is in our life. Now, Bible has a lot to say here about these issues. And it's important that we understand what these issues are and we learn how to operate according to God's principles. Why? Because if we don't, then these things are competing with God's love in our life and, our, and, and heart in our life and we we'll miss the mark. There are some very practical reasons as we look at Scripture why we, should, why we should hear what God has to say. Why? Because there's two masters we can serve out there ultimately in a man's heart and mind. And it's things or it's Jesus. There's nothing wrong with things until we start serving things. There's nothing wrong with things until we think things can bring us happiness. There's nothing wrong with blessings like that until they take the place of Jesus and those become more important than Christ. A lot of people, when we start talking about these issues of money, the first place their mind goes to is just that one thing about giving. But that's just one thing among many principles in the Word of God that He has to teach us. And many times, those other principles, other than giving, aren't really talked about. The Bible talks about earning. The Bible talks about working. The Bible talks about spending. The Bible talks about saving. These are important principles. And when we can learn individually as the people of God, to manage the things that God has blessed us with in the way that God teaches us how to manage them, it'll transform our lives. And that was the simple principles as a, that, that were taught to, to me and to my wife as very young, young believers in Jesus Christ. When somebody said, I said, I want to share with you four or five things that will change your life. In fact, 
I'm through the pastor's conferences that we do in Eastern Europe, or the pastor's conference we do in Mexico, or, or, or in Belize, we've always sought to teach these principles. You said, Brother Joe, why would you teach these biblical principles in third world countries? They're third world countries because they don't understand these principles. Because they haven't embraced these principles. And they live with an idea that so many people do, well, I don't have much, therefore I don't do much. And that's, a, that's, that's not a, a biblical principle. Even when you don't have much, you can do much. Remember Jesus as he stood over and against the treasury? Well, what you say that is, that's where the boxes were when you came into the temple for, for, for your time of worship where you would leave your gifts and your offerings to the Lord. That's the biblical way to receive offerings, by the way, is with boxes, all right, uh, that people pass and come and go by and place their offerings in. It's not in putting plates under people's noses. I'm saying that's not unbiblical. I'm just saying the biblical way is, is you have these treasury boxes. And remember the widow when she came, Jesus is standing there, and you say, oh, well, what, what's he doing watching? He happens to be the Lord. He watches everything. He notices everything. He knows this out each and every one of us do. He's standing there over, it says, the treasury, and as she places in that little bitty, bitty bit she had, Jesus turned to his disciples and says, wow, she's done more than everybody here. Because she had little, but she did much with it. And that's a whole other story, but the idea is here is that, hey, what, she understood some principles, what God had to say, and she chose to live her life by those principles, and you can be sure that God was meeting her needs as a result of that. So we have these reasons, there, there's spiritual reasons and there's, there, there's practical reasons that we do what the Lord wants. We need to learn just on a practical sense how to use what God's given us. How do we spend it? How do we invest it? What do we save? What do we give? What do we do? What do we not invest in? Do we, do we loan money? Do we get money? Do, 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 do we borrow money? Do we, all, all these things are mentioned in Scripture, what we need to do. And we need to be responsive. The biblical principles on those issues are rarely taught. So I say like next Sunday, we'll deal with just the issue of debt and getting out of debt, walking in freedom over your debt, and having a new liberty in your life that God wants you to experience in your life. It's, it's, it is absolutely freeing when you choose to do God's, God's, will, God's way. So let me give you some of these early principles, and there's a lot that we'll be sharing over the weeks to come. But this, is, this deals, first of all, with God's responsibility. Here's what God says, I'll take care of, all right? And then he's going to tell us in Scripture, what, here's what you'll take care of. But here's what, here's what I will do. And it's important you know this because this is the basis for me being free to do what I'm supposed to do. If I don't know this, then I'm sure not to do the other. If I don't understand this, I'll be surely be bound by all the other things. So it's important to understand what God has committed himself, who God is, and what he, what he, what he does. Understand, first of all, God owns everything. Does, does everybody pretty well that, right? God owns everything. What does God own? What does God own? Now, I know some of you thought it was Exxon Mobil. Some of you thought it was J.P. Morgan Chase. But no, God owns everything. You know, not, not the banks, not the financial institutions, not the folks on Wall Street. They may trade in everything, but they don't own everything. God owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord and everything, the world, and all who live in it. That's a big statement, is it not? But it, it, I just want you to, to look at that passage on the screen in Psalms there and, and think for a moment that what I'm reading there is not something that's religious and some kind of evangelical or religious verbiage. That's reality. God owns everything. He owns it all. In fact, let me just elaborate just a moment as God owns everything. One, the Bible tells us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, but also says God owns all the silver and God owns all the gold, according to Haggai, verse, chapter 2, verse 8. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. So who owns all the gold? All right, if we're going to sit down and divide up all the gold and all the silver, pack it up in a big room on a big table and say, okay, everybody who owns some of this, come get it, God stops everybody right there and says, excuse me. I may let you use it for a while, but it's mine. I own it all. In fact, God not only that, we said the earth is the Lord's. The land, in Leviticus says, God said the land's mine. I'll tell you how to manage the land. And he gave them simple rules for how they would manage the land. And how they, although they owned it, they were not really owners, they were managers. Like, this might surprise you. God owns all the animals. Your dogs, your cats, whose are they? They belong to the Lord. So I think I'll send him the vet bill next time. <laughs> 
but it all belongs to God. The deer, all right, they belong to God. The fish, they belong to God. Now, I know the state wants to tell us they really belong to them, so you have to pay them a price to be able to hunt them and all those things like that. But whether you hunt them or not, the idea is that they're really not ours anyway. We can manage them, but we don't own them. God owns everything. The scriptures in Psalms 50, every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all that's in it. I said, why should I tell you I'm hungry? You can't meet a need I have. I have everything. I'll take care of myself. Now, I want you to know God's the only person that can say that. You say, oh, no, Bill Gates can say that. No, Bill Gates can't say that. You could all be gone from Bill Gates in a moment. All right? Or you could just die. Nothing he's going to do about anything at that point, is there? Everything, all of it belongs to God. And why does it all belong to him? Simple principle. He created it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God owns it all. And by the way, not only does he own it all, he never transferred the ownership of his creation to anybody at any time. Even with Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden and told them to manage it and to prosper from it, and to benefit from it, but to tend it, to, to manage it, to be a steward over it. There's no place in your life where you can honestly sit back and say, hey, everything in my books, everything in my bank, everything, everything in my Roth, everything in my IRA, everything in my annuity, all those things, everything in my mutual fund, that's all mine. Listen, one turn of the economy, it'll all be gone like that. All gone like that. So who do we put our trust in? Well, Brother Joe, you know I got my trust in the U.S. government because I'm on, medic, you know, I'm on Social Security. I don't know if I could sleep well at night. <laughs> Amen. Well, I understand that God is in charge of everything at any time. Social Security is bankrupt. In reality, it is bankrupt. They just haven't acknowledged it yet. And given enough time on the course that they're on, there's not a lot of hope for that. But here's my freedom. God created all things. God's owned all things. And as a, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? Hey, he transfers management to me, but I realize that he owns everything and he owns all my possessions. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't give up everything, you can't be my disciple. So every Christian should be living with a simple understanding that, hey, everything I've got, God's been given me by God. And I put it all on the altar and I keep it all on the altar and say, Lord, do with it what you want. You just guide me. I'll do with it. I'll manage it. I'll handle it the way you tell me to do, but it's all yours. That's the safest place you'll ever be. That's the, that's the place of the most victory you'll ever be. But if you're not living with this concept right here and understanding this right here, you're failing. Now, a lot of people got this concept down about what God expects and that God is in control, all right, to some degree, but they're not living it out. But you have to understand that not only does he own all things, he created all things, he literally can control all things. It's not like he's some abstract figure out there who owns everything and doesn't have any, anything he ever does. I mean, our loving Heavenly Father is in ultimate control of every event that happened. The Bible tells us the Lord, what's this? The Lord does whatever he ple what pleases him in heaven and in the earth. The Bible goes on to say in Daniel, I praise the Most High. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth, no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Because he's God. He has, now the, idea is, the idea is here that somebody would question what God does. They can't. He's God. You're not. He's God. I'm not. And all I can do is say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But what I don't understand is that God is doing something unique. It should be comforting for those of us who do know Jesus personally that as he is a creator and as he is owner and as he is controller of all things, he is always looking out for me on my behalf. And that God, even though my situations may get extreme, although there may be genuine difficulty that I have to face in my life, the Bible says according to Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for my good. Because I love God. I'm one of his called. Now, that should be comforting. Not only does God own all things, it, he controls all things, and he has the capacity to make, no matter what happens in this sin-plagued world, because this world is sin-plagued, 
and because it is simply a lot of bad stuff happens and God gets the blame for a lot of bad stuff. But what God can do is take all the junk that comes down the pike and make it out for good for me. Even the worst of it. There's victory in that. But I have to realize that God is, is over it. And a great illustration of this is in the life of Joseph. You remember who was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, thrown into prison later for a false accusation about immorality, and his life was miserable. And, and Joseph meets his brothers later in Genesis 45. And he says, hey, <clears throat> do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It was not for you, if it were not for you, who sent me here, but God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to the saving of many lives. Joseph is in a place as the prime minister of Egypt to feed the nation of Israel and to take care of his family. But he wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for, but God. But God. But God. I was a slave. I was sold in slavery. I became a slave in Potiphar's house. I, raised a, I finally became the chief slave in Potiphar's house. And then his wife came after me, and I refused to have a sexual relationship with her, and I took off. She said that I did. She lied. Now I'm in prison. Because you guys are the sorriest family that a man could ever have. It's because of you I went through all this hell. And he's saying, you know, I understand that if it hadn't been the grace of God moving and using all the situations of mine to turn out for good, you know, everything would be horrible. There'd be no answer for a resolution for our crisis that we're in today. But God put me through all that sort of this moment in time. He realizes the sovereignty and the, and the control of God. Now, that's God's responsibility to be over our lives. And here, in, in doing that, understand that God says, as he does this, he'll provide for us. In Genesis, it says, 22, he, he's spoken of as Jehovah Jireh. When Abraham is offering his son on the altar, God intervenes. And remember, he offers another sacrifice, which he does for us. That was prophetic how Jesus would be the sacrifice for our sins. But at that place, it's is, is, is called a sacred place, Abraham says. And we'll call this place Jehovah Jireh. That's what we say in Texas and Hebrews, Jehovah Yiddi. It, it's literally God provides. God provides. God will provide. God meets the need, no matter what the need is. So I understand that there's responsibilities, and God has these responsibilities over my life. I'll have some, but God says he will meet every need. What's it say here in, in Matthew? You know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things, meaning the food and the clothing, clothing that's what they were talking about in the context of this. He said they'll be given to you. They were, they were sitting around, they were talking about the raiment. What, what are we going to wear? And How are we going to eat? And how are we going to have shelter? And Jesus clearly says, hey, Father's in control of all things, and you just seek him, he'll take care of it. That's his responsibility. It's his responsibility to take care of your clothing. It's his responsibility to feed me. It's his responsibility to feed you. It's his responsibility to give you shepherd, to, to give you shelter in your life. Paul put it this way, my God will supply all your need according to his glorious riches by Christ Jesus. Because of my relationship with the Son, because of my relationship as a child of God with Jesus, his Son, God has become my Father and God will provide for my needs. Now, understand, it doesn't always happen the way you think it will. There's a theological terminology used for God, and it's like this. It's, there's this, this, it's a doctrine of immutability. It says that God is immutable. It, it simply means that God doesn't change. You know, if God loved me yesterday, he loved me today. If God loved me yesterday, he's going to love me forever. God's, God is just immutable. In other words, when God says something, that's it. It means that God's for today everything he's always been for. It means God is against today all the things he's always been against. He doesn't change. If, he's, if he was against it yesterday, he's against it today. Now, I know that does away with a lot of this open theology movement where people want to say, well, God, God approves different lifestyles now, and God approves immoralities, and God approves homosexuality, and God No, 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 no. If God was against it yesterday. He's against it today. All right? He does not change. But this is, this is a, a, an understanding that should bless us because if God could change his mind about those moral issues, then certainly he could change his mind about these issues. And, well, I used to, that was an old promise. I was going to feed you then, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I was going to take care of your food, clothing, raiment then, but no, I'm not going to do that anymore because I'm, I'm, I'm changing God. And I changed my mind about you. Or wouldn't we all be in trouble? Now, when I say this, I, to say that, that what God is, is immutable, that means that God is predictable. 
in, in many ways. The scripture, Hosea said he's like the former rain and like the latter rain. In other words, the former rain came at a certain season and the latter rain came at a certain season every year. And it was predictable that there, the rainy seasons are coming. But understand, God says, although I'm predictable, there are some things about me that aren't so predictable. And I think it's important we understand that, that he is predictable in many ways and he's unpredictable. He's predictable that he's going to provide in his faithfulness to meet my needs. All right? He's going to do it. And he gives me biblical principles how that's going to work out in my heart and in my life. Now, he is unpredictable in just how he's going to meet my needs. All right? So I can't lock God in a box and say this is the way he's always going to do it. But he's going to do it. It's going to happen this way today. It may happen another way tomorrow. In the word of God, you always, though, discover the Lord provided for his people in a lot of different ways, many times other than the expected ways. The children of Israel. God calls them out of Egypt, calls them to the promised land. They travel for 40 years. How are, they going, how are you going to have your needs met? You, don't, you, know, you, you can't raise crops. You're, wondering, you're, you're traveling every day for 40 years. You, know, you can't run down to Costco or Sam's or Walmart. There's just not any out there in the wilderness. What's going to happen? God said, the Bible tells us that God fed them for those 40 years with manna. He fed them with water. He gave them everything they needed while they were there. He gave, in the New Testament, we see Jesus providing different ways at different times. You see, at one point, he, he feeds the, the mass of 5,000 plus people with just, you know, five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, understand that if God can take care of the Jews in the wilderness for 40 years, or he can take care of that need of the afternoon of those people who were hungry because they've been following him all day long, and he feeds them with just five loaves and two fishes, I think I should reiterate and re-embrace the truth of God's word that says, God's going to meet my needs. And the Bible absolutely tells me I should not worry. I should not worry. God's going to meet my needs. He's going to provide for me. This is the same God who told Elijah, you go to the king, you tell the king, it's not going to rain. There's not going to be any dew on the earth even. There's not going to be a drop of water from the skies until I give the word and it disappears. And the Lord leads Elijah away. Now, I'm sure that Elijah's thinking, okay, that was a nice sermon, but, you know, that's going to affect me too. If there's a drought in the land, that, I'm, that's going to affect me too, right? But what did the Lord do? The Lord led Elijah, fed Elijah, took care of Elijah. At one point, he's feeding him by the brook of Cherith. He's got ravens flying in, bringing him meat in the morning and meat in the afternoon. And he keeps the brook alive right there where Elijah is and then it finally dwindles. God takes him somewhere and meets his need in a completely different way than he did before. In other words, when he goes to the next place, he's probably looking for the ravens to bring lunch and they don't bring it. And God says, no, here's how I'm going to meet your need today. That's why it's important that we do not let materialism capture our heart and rob us of our fellowship and our intimacy with God so we understand and we're attentive to how God is moving in our life. And we can hear what God has to say to us in our life. But if we're so preoccupied with this world, we live in doubts and fears and worries, we're always going to be trying to put God in a little box and it never works. But understand this, God said he will take care of you. And he can take care of you because why? He's God, he created all things, he owns all things, he controls all things. And because he controls all things and he cares about me, mark it down, God's going to take care of Joe Arms. God's going to take care of me. Why don't you just say that out loud to yourself? God's going to take care of me. Take care of me. Turn to somebody around you and say, God's going to take care of me. <laughs> and I tell you, there's been a lot of times in my life in ministry I've had to remind myself of that. And to remind God of that. God, you said you're going to take care of me. And I'm going to trust you for that. I'm going to believe it. Now, we have some responsibilities. On the other hand, and there are going to be some of these are things we'll be talking about in the future, but we need to understand responsibility. One is that we, we are stewards. We're just managers. You know, stewards is a manager of someone else's possessions. That really everything in my possession is not mine. I'm there to handle it. I'm there to manage it. Got that? So it belongs to who? And I'm to do what with it? Manage it. And how am I to manage it? According to the word of God, the principles that God gives me in his word. But I have to get in here to find out what they are, obviously, amen? How am I going to do that? Well, let me give you the first important principle of this, of your responsibilities. You should, you, you should be faithful. God owns everything. He simply gives you the responsibility to manage the things that he's given you and do it according to what his scripture tells you. It, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, it's required of a steward that they be faithful. So we're to be faithful with what we have. 
What do you have? Well, I don't have much. Be faithful with that. Be faithful with it. In fact, sometimes it's when we don't have much that we're the least faithful. We're afraid. We get worried. I can't do that. It won't work. There's no way I can do that. It doesn't make sense. The numbers don't work for me. The math is not right. But God doesn't use your math. God has his own math he's working by. It's called his power and his might and his word. But we're just, we're to be faithful with what we have. We're to be faithful. And people think, well, well faithful stewards, that, you're talking about tithe, you know? Tithe, well, that's, that's a good starting place, but it, this encompasses much more than just the financial things that God's encompassing. It deals with all those areas. You really can categorize them in, in kind of like three areas. It, it, it's faithful with, yes, my treasures, whatever God gives them. But it's faithful with my time. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about time. It has a lot to say about what time is God's time and what time is your time. Just as it does about finances. Your talents. Your talents make up those things in your life, which, uh, which we talk about natural as well as spiritual gifts. God's given you a spiritual gift, you're to use it. He's given you natural gifts, a natural ability. There's something in every one of our lives in this room that we just, we do, and we do pretty well. All right? We, we, people just say, well, you got a knack for that. You ever somebody say that? Well, you're good at that. And it's something that you do, and you do it well. And you, for the most time, you pretty much enjoy doing it. You're good at it, too. And, and, and you, you know, you look at somebody else and you say, well, I don't have what they have, but they don't have what you have. And God calls us to be faithful stewards of the time and the talents, natural as well as spiritual, as well as the treasures. And don't get preoccupied and sidetracked because this applies to every bit of your life. We're to be faithful with what we have, but we're to be faithful in little things as well. And sometimes we don't look at the, the little things. The Bible says, whoever can be trusted with a very little can be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with a little will also be dishonest with much. In other words, you don't have much because perhaps you haven't been faithful in a little. And if God gave you the much, you'd be dishonest about that. What do you say? Dishonest. Well, dishonesty means that you're not honoring the Lord and his biblical principles. Now, uh, here's where I get a little feedback from people. They say, well, you know, I just don't believe what you believe about, about giving. Well, I don't give a rip if you believe what I believe or not. I'm not going to lose any sleep on it. Oh, so I was say, I mean, I don't believe what I like believing. That doesn't hurt my feelings. You can come after and say, I don't believe it. Fine. I'm still going to get blessed. But you're not. Because what I'm believing is the Bible, not what the Baptist told me. What did the Bible have to say? What are these principles concerning spending? What are the principles concerning giving? What are the principles concerning debt? What are they? And if I violate those principles and the simple things that God gives us in his word, then I'm, I'm going to suffer from it. But if I abide by what God says, then I'll be blessed from it. That's, that's, that's the simplicity of the whole thing. But most of the time, as I said earlier, where we fail is in the little things, all right? You say, well, I don't have a lot of talent. You know, I can't play the keyboard like Jerry can, or I, 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 I can't play the instruments like the band can. I, I can't sing like Crystal or whoever. I just, I don't have that. But you've got something you can do a lot better than they do. Will you be faithful to use that? Well, it's not much. Did God give it to you? Well, yeah. Then you honor him with it. Because if you won't honor him with that, don't expect anything else. Don't expect anything else. Don't sit around whining because God's not blessing you. When God's giving you an avenue and a doorway that you can open and go through and experience some greater blessing in your life. And it really always gets down to bottom line where the, you know, we can say, well, it's just, it's just that I'm afraid. And we talk about fears. We talk about all these different. But it really gets down to just a lack of faith many times. We just won't believe God. We just won't trust him. And we become... We become, in, we become entrapped. We, we won't be faithful with the small things. But if you'll be faithful with the small things. Now, why would I want to be faithful just on, on a particular personal basis? One, because I love Jesus. I mean, that's really what I always boils down to before anything else. I need to check up on my love relationship. Do I really love Jesus? Do I really believe God? But when you do practice the biblical principles of God's word, there are benefits that will do, that will happen. You're going to grow closer to Christ. We talked about how these things compete with your intimacy with Jesus. It was Jesus said, you know, whoever has my commands and obeys them, you know, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be led to my father. And I too will love him. But listen to this part. And I will show myself to him. Now, if you didn't know what the true riches were a while ago, and he says, give you the true riches, this is the true riches. You experience the presence of Jesus in a very real way. You experience the presence, just because faithfulness brings about 
Your love for Jesus brings out a deeper realization and a deeper capacity to love God and know God and see God in a spiritual way working in your life. I can't see God with my eyes, but I can see him in so many different other ways. I see God moving. I see God answering prayers. And I see God working in things that didn't seem possible. So my commitment should be to faithfully apply God's word, his principles to my life. And what's going to happen? I'm going to grow closer to the Lord because he said, if you love me the way you're supposed to, you do what I tell you to do, you're going to draw closer to me. I didn't make that up. That's just what it says. You want to draw closer to the Lord? But not only that, we develop this thing we call character in our life. In fact, if you look at those scriptures we shared, God kind of says, hey, uh, you know, what you do with your money kind of re- defines your character. You know, if you're selfish and stingy, it's, it's relevant because you don't give. It's, it's a reality. It's, it's evidence by your life. How you handle your money is an outside indicator of what's really going on in your heart. All right? That's, you know, if, how you deal with, with those issues is really, you know, if you're not being honest, then you're dishonest. If you're not being, you know, uh, faithful, then you're being unfaithful. It's, it's like this. It, can I do what God says and trust the Lord? You know, it's amazing to me that some of you in this room will actually, whether you, whether you would say it or not, you refuse to think it, but so let me say it for you and think it for you. Some of you will have no problem walking into your local convenience store, plopping out some cash on the table, buying a roll of lotto tickets from the state of Texas and thinking that you're going to get a payoff from the state. And you have more faith in the state, which never hardly ever gives you a dime. A guy, well, I went about 40 bucks a week. How much you spend? How about 60? Excuse me? Do the math. What about your giving? Well, you know, I can't afford to give. You can't afford to give, but you can spend $200 a month on cigarettes? Can I get a witness? <laughs> you can afford to pick up your favorite bottle of wine? You can afford another six pack? Hello. It's bad enough when he's talking about money. Now he's, now he's, now he's just digging. Well, I'm just saying, look, hey, we're, our character is easily revealed. We don't, we don't see it at all many times. But Jesus is making it very clear to us. But let me tell you, the benefit is that, that I get close to the Lord. My character gets stronger. I develop more faithfulness to God. I develop more faith in God and more trust with God and more love for Jesus. And also, in a very practical sense, I begin to experience more stability in my life. Because obviously, when you begin to spend more wisely, when you start saving as the Lord instructs, and preparing for the rainy days as the Lord says, there should be like the ant, look at the ant, you know? When you start giving the way that God says for you to give, honoring the things that God wants you to honor with your gift to the Lord, you know, you can begin to experience some stability in your life that you never experienced before. Now, be careful and be cautious, and I'll say in just a moment, about the extreme of this, you know, the people say, well, if you get right with God, God wants everybody rich. That's not what the Bible says. Everybody's supposed to drive a, you know, a, you know, a luxury car, and everybody's supposed to, that, that's not what, you know. The problem, most time there's people's love of money at that point. They want to drive the luxury car more than they want to walk with God. And so they're willing to make a, a choice at that point. But money and possessions, they can be used for good. They can be used for evil. The money literally becomes just a tool in the hands of God's people. It's really all it boils down to. In the Old Testament, the Lord extended rewards of abundance to his people when they were obedient. And there would be threats of poverty to those who would not be obedient. But even in the New Testament, there are times when God offers us, hey, I can bring stability to your life. I can bless you for your giving. I'll, I'll repay what you give to the Lord. And we, we start looking at all these principles and we start applying these principles, then there's a greater stability in our life. This is what Deuteronomy, it's such a clarity where it lays it out, where God's speaking to his people. I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his word, his commandments, and the Lord your God will bless you. Now, that's nothing different from Genesis to the book of Revelation when the Bible always clearly lays out there's one or two ways you can go here. You can love God or you can love stuff. You can love God or you can love yourself. You can love God or you can love the world. All right? There's two roads. And they both end, have, have, have a destination. Road A ends in misery, death, pain, destruction. He said it's death and destruction in hell. Road B goes to heaven. Life. And it's life on the way to life. Glory unto glory. God's nearness, God's presence, God's blessing, God's grace. 
And as you pursue that path, it's never about finding more in a, in a financial. It's although you be, can begin to experience more. It's always about glorifying God. It's always about honoring God. Yet we get so picky about this, and so we just miss it. In Psalms 35, 27, it reads like this. The Lord delights in, in the prosperity of his servant. And prosperity, again, means God meets your needs and God blesses you. As we've talked about in 2 Corinthians before, where it says God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You have all sufficiency in all things. That verse, you know, we'll look at it, probably the closing verse in just a moment. But what it will say there is that, hey, God wants to meet your needs and give you enough that you have money left over to meet other people's needs. Take care of all your needs. And also you become a supply to helping other people and helping other people in need. And as we faithfully apply what God has given us, I think there's a legitimate place where God begins to prosper us and God meets our need. If you're not bound up in debt, you certainly have freedom in your life. Amen? In 3 John, the last letter of John to the church, chap, chapter, there's no one, one, chap, one, verse, one chapter, no verses, but two. He says, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. I know that didn't come out right. There's a verse here from the Word of God that God says, hey, here's a prayer of John for the church. I'm praying for you that you'll prosper. Your body will prosper. I'm praying that your finances will prosper just as your soul prospers. We know our soul prospers because it loves Jesus. But the Bible does say God has blessings for our lives. There's nowhere in the Bible that it does say that you have to be poor to know God or to walk with God. And there's nowhere in the Bible that says you're going to be rich if you know God and love God. That's an extreme error on the other end. But if you go back to the life of Joseph, he, he experienced both. He was born an extreme blessing. His dad was wealthy. All right? They had much. But guess what? When famine came, it took it all away. Joseph goes from prosperity to poverty to prison, back to being just a slave, ultimately to being the prime minister of Egypt by the grace of God. The guideline, I believe, for this prosperity, I don't have it on the screen, but you can scribble this note down. First John, first, uh, Joshua, excuse me. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 says, Do not let this book of the law, the word of God, depart from your mouth. In other words, learn to speak God's word. And then meditate on it day and night. Become familiar with God's word. So that you may be careful to do what's written. In other words, you learn it, you memorize it, you meditate on it, and you obey it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You may not have a dime, but you're still going to be prosperous and successful. Your needs are going to be met. God's going to take care of you. He's going to meet the needs of your life and your family and your heart. There's really only, in Joshua, there's only two requirements met that need to be met really for prosperity. One is memorization, meditation of the Word of God, and then obedience to the Word of God. I think we need to understand just a little better understanding of what prosperity is. And let me close with these little simple points here. One, it does not mean the righteousness, when you get right with God, it equals riches. That's false. There's claim as, and statement in the scriptures, a, a statement that says, hey, if you, you put you the love of the money, if that's where you put your love, it's the root of all evil. And if you covet after that, you're going to err from your faith, you'll walk with God, and you're going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows. If life is about chasing the buck for you, you're going to be miserable. If it's about just getting more dollars so you can heap them up, that's not what life's about. And that's not what righteousness is about. But on the other hand, as long as it's not riches, but it's also not poverty, all right? It's not poverty. Remember the rich young ruler? He had everything. Jesus said, go give it all away. Well, what would have happened? Well, Jesus has been preaching not, not too much before that, hey, given will be given unto you. Press down, shake together, running over. My father put it back in your lap. All right? So even if he had given everything away, God probably just gave it right back to him. But his love for money kept him from following the Lord. His love for things kept him from being faithful to God. And you say, well, that's the rich young ruler. But there's a lot of people in our churches today who fill our churches every Sunday who kind of tip God if they do that much and feel they've fulfilled their faithful responsibility as a child of God to honor God with their wealth. And they haven't. And they wonder why all these other junks going on in their life, why all these issues keep coming up, and why they keep getting deeper in trouble financially because they just won't honor God. The simplest of the simplest of the simplest thing in Scripture is, you honor me, I'll honor you. Because the truth of it is, is that righteousness, your life with God, will equal prosperity in the truest biblical sense. And that prosperity is that 2 Corinthians 9 verses, God is able to make his grace abound towards you. That you will always have all sufficiency in all things. 
You may have bound every good work. So, Brother Judge, that's spiritual. You know what we always say about Bible teaching? It's context, context, context. The context of chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians is all about how we deal with our money, how we deal with our earthly possessions, how we deal with our personal things that we have. What do we do with those things? We need to understand God's in control. God created it all. God owns it all. God can do with it whatever he wants to do. And if I'll just be faithful with my responsibility and his responsibility, when you wed those together, my needs are met. My needs are met. In fact, to be honest with you, if you looked at the children of Israel wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, that's a backslidden bunch as you could find. If you read the story, amen? Unbelieving. In fact, the whole generation had died. So they got to go to the promised land. They were that way, and God still met their needs. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They had food every time it was time to eat. Water every time it was time to drink. Because God is faithful. So the real question, I'll close with this. I keep saying that. This is it. If you can read the print up there, but it says the real question is who's in control? Your checkbook and your financial records, they reveal the truth about who's in control. It's not your words. It's not what you say with your mouth. It's not what you declare. You got a giving statement. You usually do it at the end of the year at Believers Fellowship. All you got to do is you take your W 2 out and look at your giving statement. You got a W 2, didn't you? <laughs> Just look at it. That's a little bit. You, you compare real quick. How faithful am I? You know? In, in this regard. How obedient am I? Well, I don't believe that 10% giving. Usually, most people who say that don't believe in any giving. So my question is, what do you believe then? I don't believe in 10% giving. I think that's an Old Testament model at best. It was an Old Testament command to the Jews, and I aren't one. I'm a born-again believing Gentile heathen. <laughs> Amen? But I can look at the models and see a good standard where to start with giving in my life. And I can faithfully commit to begin there and see what God does. Long time ago, our commitment as a young married couple was to, one, we wanted to be the biggest givers in Believer's Fellowship, percentage-wise. We don't want anybody in the church to ever outgive us. That was our desire. And I, since I don't know what everybody makes, I don't know if that's happened or not. But if you want to bring them in, we'll sit down and compare them together. And if you win, I'll say praise the Lord, but I'll give a little more. <laughs> that's, that was our desire. We want to sit, we want to be role models in that regard. We want to set a standard in that regard. But that ought to be every one of our passions. Just, hey, uh, let me lead the charge, Lord. Let, let me be an example of the righteous. Let me be an example of the faithful. Let, put my life on, on as a testimony of what you can do. And God has blessed my wife and I. God has blessed us greatly. We don't owe the credit cards a dime. The only debt we have is a small amount on our house that we're still working on. And it's the goal to be free of that. But we've taken biblical actions and we're taking biblical steps and we're taking biblical moves towards getting to that place of freedom in our life. But I want you to know, just being free of credit cards, and we got in, you know, we were deep, you know, uh, just to say tens of thousands of dollars, like the average American is today. Tens of thousands of dollars. And got that way out of stupidity, not, in, not embracing the Word of God, taking about five to seven years of being disobedient in our finances, we were still tithing, but we were violating a lot of other principles. You see, that tithing is just one of many principles. We were violating a lot of other principles. And we were helping God. Who didn't need our help? Those were good excuses we all make, right? And we just missed the mark. We finally got to the place, hey, this is not the way God's called us to live our life. All right? Now, we used a lot of good religious excuses we stepped out in faith to start a church. There's no paycheck. There's no salary coming. You know, uh, it's not at all like it is today. You know, the church pays us a nice salary. But in those for early days, you know, if we got $300 for a week of ministry work, that was, that was full-time pay. 
You know, if we got 500, I mean, we got our first $500 check from the church, that was a hallelujah, you know. And the first 10 years of the church, we didn't put anything back in annuities or anything like that, retirement funds, which our, our staff can enjoy now in these days. That didn't happen. So we were helping God out with the credit cards. Doesn't that sound stupid? It sounded reasonable with time, but that's how far the mind can drift when you're not really committed to the principles of God's word. God does not need Joe Arms' help on any level. He said, if I need it, I wouldn't even ask for it. We read that verse earlier? I just need to trust God. We repented and started making some right decisions. God's liberating our life more and more and more every day. God's good. But let me tell you this more than anything else. If he doesn't hurt anything today, he can be trusted. And the only way you can, only way that you can say, I, I know that and I believe that is by being faithful yourself. That's the amen to that. Okay. God, you can be trusted. The question is, can I be? Be trusted with what God's put in my hands. Can you be trusted with what God's given your hands? Because the real picture is not told in what we say to each other and what we say we do. It's what we really do. Amen? <laughs> Maybe it should be, oh, me. God's good. And I say, and I don't, I, 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 I'm closing this service by just saying, hey, when that man set us down that many years ago, it changed our life. We've been changed by, and saved. But these principles and understanding changed our life. And now we're able to do a lot more stuff than we've ever been able to do in ministry. And I can't even go into some of them because they're just right hand, left hand kind of thing, if you know what I mean. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. But God's good. Let's stand together. I'm not going to give a, an invitation, but Jerry, I'd like you just to come.